the way I look at overall aging of the skin is I focus on five main factors that really contribute to it. What you eat, when you eat, supplements, skincare products and treatments, we can really target all five of those to efficiently reverse that and allow our body to once again regenerate itself. Known as America's holistic plastic surgeon, Dr. Anthony Yoon is a board certified plastic surgeon and the author of several best-selling books. With a focus on holistic treatments and also pointing out some of the flaws of the plastic surgery industry, he's actually the most followed plastic surgeon in the world on social media with over 4.5 million subscribers. And he's here to talk about his complete holistic guide to turning back the clock using the power of auto juvenation. So we had a conversation before doing this episode because I have been in this field for over 20 years yeah. and I've been encouraging people to transform their health through science-backed lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. And so having a plastic surgeon on the show, I was skeptical yeah. to say the least. Oh yeah. And we jumped on a call and you shared your perspective. You shared your approach to things. You shared why you're doing what you're doing and also, you know, it just it was inspiring, it was an inspiring oh, call. You. And you're also hilarious, by the way. <laughs> but if you could, can you start off by sharing what helped you to make a shift? Because you have dubbed yourself and you are widely known as holistic plastic surgeon. Mm -hmm. So what inspired that change? So I went through traditional trading. I have an MD from Michigan State University. I went through three years of general surgery residency, two years of plastic surgery residency, and then I spent a year out here in Beverly Hills uh, where I worked with a top uh, plastic surgeon in kind of like an apprenticeship fellowship. And so I was always taught as surgeons, we're taught to cut is to cure, or the only way to heal is with cold steel. And these are sayings that are thrown around in residencies for surgery. So I was always taught that the goal of being a plastic surgeon or a surgeon just in general was to bring people to the operating room. And when you bring people to the operating room, we gauge our success as surgeons on how many operations we're performing and the complexity of the operation. So if you're a general surgeon, the operation that you strive to be able to do someday is the Whipple. The Whipple is a 10 hour massive cancer operation. And if you're so lucky that you can perform it, it really is a blessing for you, essentially. Uh, in plastic surgery, that procedure is probably the facelift. You know, people may trust almost anybody to do their liposuction, but you know if they're gonna pay you to do their facelift that you've gotta be really good. So Sean, for many years, I gauged the success of my practice based off how many facelifts I was doing. And I thought I'd reached the pinnacle of success many years ago where I had people flying in from all across the country to have work done, facelifts done by myself. I had an over one year waiting list. And then I had a patient who completely changed the trajectory of my career. Uh, I had a patient who uh, underwent a facelift and had an absolutely terrible complication afterwards. One that wasn't my fault, it wasn't her fault, um, but things just happen. Um, she was a 60 some year old woman who came to my office. I, I did this face of surgery on her. We had her looked at and, and cleared by her cardiologist and her internist. I performed the operation on a Thursday, uh, see her the next morning on Friday at the hospital where I did the surgery at, and then I sent her home. I went through the weekend and I come back to the office Monday morning and I have a call, uh, a uh, message from her daughter. And that message was, why did my mom die? I was absolutely floored. And it turns out over that weekend, she suddenly died. And so I was obviously completely distraught after this. I tried to figure out what happened. It took many months before we found the results of the autopsy and things. I sent all the money that she paid for her surgery back to her family so they could help pay for her arrangements. And I looked through everything that I could figure out is there anything that I did wrong? You know, was there a medication um, allergy? Was there something, you know, like two medications that interacted? And there was nothing, absolutely nothing. I even had her cleared by her cardiologist. It turns out she had a massive heart attack, even though she was cleared by her cardiologist just a couple weeks before that. So that sent me into a complete spiral downward as I really questioned, am I doing the right thing for my patients? You know, this Hippocratic Oath of do no harm. Am I doing harm? And I considered leaving plastic surgery altogether. Um, and I finally, after kind of digging myself out of this dark hole of guilt 
And I finally realized what I needed to do. And what I needed to do was change the paradigm and change that goal. And the goal should not be bringing people to the operating room. My goal should be how do I keep people out of the operating room and get them to feel uh, and look their best and feel like they don't need to go under the knife. And that's what uh, came, that's how I came to this, my new book, Younger for Life, and this whole concept of auto rejuvenation, using your body's own regenerative abilities to rejuvenate itself. Yeah, wow. The story itself was like, when you shared it, it was it was kind of shocking, of course. Like if, if something like that happens, I know that it you, as you shared, like you were questioning and just like looking at this thing and that thing and trying to, sometimes we want to go back and see if could I do something differently. But it led led you to opening up an entirely new perspective and helping so many more people now. And as you shared in the book, and by the way, again, this book is hilarious. There's so many, <laughs> you. so many little great jokes in the book. And uh, if people aren't following you on social media, they should definitely be following yeah, you as well. You. And you shared in the book that you made this shift from being a more traditional quote, cut first plastic surgeon surgeon to a holistic plastic surgeon mm -hmm. and shifting the focus to helping keep people out of the operating room. And you just shared this term auto mm -hmm. is really your big approach. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's this idea that um, our body has innate regenerative abilities uh, and it can rejuvenate itself, but we need to give it the tools and the environment in order to do that. You know, our body wants to heal itself. Our body has these amazing regenerative abilities, but the way we treat our body in today's day and age is hindering that from happening. And so the concept of autojuvenation really focuses on five main things. It's what you eat, when you eat, nutritional supplements, skincare, and non-invasive treatments. And I firmly believe that by focusing on those five things, using that concept of autojuvenation, anywhere from 80 to 90% of people can look and feel amazing and not feel they need to go under the knife or even get injections and things like that. One of the cool lines from your book, and I'm gonna read this directly, you shared, why get a facelift when you could get a life lift, right? And so focusing on that, you know, you still are, of course, a practicing plastic surgeon, yes. but encouraging people to, again, why just a facelift when you can get a life lift and help every cell in your body work better? Exactly. And the way I look at it overall is that when you look at procedures like facelifts, like Botox, like fillers, the way I look at it, it's like you're building a house. And those procedures are the spiral at the top of the house. When you're building a house, you don't start by trying to figure that part of it out. You start by creating the foundation. And the foundation is what you eat. What you eat is the absolute most important thing that will determine the health and the quality of your skin. And so what you eat can increase the speed at which your skin ages, and it can slow that process down. And to an extent, may even, maybe even reverse it a little bit. Um, but the way I look at it in the end, though, is it is like you're building a house and that that foundation is going to be the food. And then you add, uh, once again, the when you eat part of it, which would be potentially adding intermittent fasting to it, the supplements, because we know that our food is not as nutritious as it used to be. Uh, and then you also have to add the other stuff on the outside, like the skincare. You know, that is a huge part of turning back the clock and getting beautiful skin as well. So it's kind of funny because, you know, I joke that if you were to ask a holistic physician or holistic practitioner, how do I get beautiful, healthy skin? They'll tell you to heal your gut. Heal your gut and you'll get beautiful skin. If you ask a dermatologist, they'll say use sunscreen uh, and use a retinoid. And if you ask a plastic surgeon, they'll say use Botox and get a facelift. And really the truth is, is, is the best approach I strongly believe is a true integrative approach. It's taking those recommendations uh, from more holistic and alternative medicine and combine that with the more traditional, you know, dermatologic uh, recommendations. And, and that's what I have created. And, and that's what I'm so proud of because I think, you know, I know there are books written by holistic practitioners all about the gut and what to eat for better skin. There's dermatologists who've written great books about products to apply, but I've never actually written one that combines kind of the best of both worlds. And that's what I wanted to create. Yeah. You know, for me, it's always looking at what is, what is it? All right. So what I mean by that is if you're talking about the health of your skin, what is your skin made of? Yep. And it is literally made from the food that you eat, the nutrients that you're providing your body. And so treating it topically, yes, that is one approach. And also your, your skin eats and consumes these things. Mm -hmm. But are we providing our bodies with the raw materials to really make healthy tissues? Exactly. And one of those things with the skin health, and you talk about this several times in the book, is collagen. 
Yes, talk a little bit about that. So 70 to 80% of our skin is composed of collagen. Collagen is that part of your skin that causes your skin to feel tight, to feel thick, and to feel strong. And when we're younger, our skin has a lot of collagen. It's nice and tight and smooth. And the way I describe it, it's kind of like the logs of a log cabin. And when you're younger, that log cabin is new. The logs are strong, they're shiny, they're smooth. But as we get older, starting about in our mid to late 20s, we start losing about 1% of the thickness of our collagen every year. Women, after menopause, that increases to upwards of 2% a year. And that's why you see some women who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s who have tissue paper thin skin, so thin that sometimes they can get a scratch and it tears their skin. You don't see this as much in men because they don't go through that menopause process. And so really focusing on the collagen is a huge part of slowing down that aging process when you're looking at the skin and the external uh, visible effects of overall aging. Uh, and where does that start with? Well, collagen is a large protein. And so in order for us to retain that collagen, slow that collagen degradation down, you want to definitely have enough protein in your diet. You know, making that distinction with menopause and the loss of collagen, that speaks to the how much our hormones impact the, the health of our skin as well. Yes. And our skin is really an extension of our nervous system, you know, and so, so many outward things like even stress it's another oh, yeah. thing as well can have a big impact on how you age. Yeah, I mean, you only need to look at the U.S. presidents when they go into office and when they exit office four to eight years later that to part, know that yeah. stress is a huge factor in overall aging. I mean, you know, you have to assume that going through, you know, being the most powerful person in the country, potentially in the world, they're going to have the absolute best medical care. But at the same time, they age so quickly in those four to eight years, and that's basically due to the stress. You shared in the book, and I'm just gonna read this directly. You said, you know, for many people, they have this experience of one day looking in the mirror and asking, how did I go from being a Spice Girl to being a Golden Girl, <laughs> yes. right? Sometimes it just like hits you, like what happened? Where did the time go? And you shared how a big part of the way that we age, like aging isn't something that you can just suddenly stop or make it disappear. Mm -hmm. It is a phenomenon in our universe or in this part of the universe, at least. And we do have colleagues who would denote aging as a disease and looking at it from that perspective as something mm -hmm. that can be treated and potentially cured. I personally never really completely resonated with that mm -hmm. because I think it's negating the value of aging, mm -hmm. right? And you talk about that in the book as well, but more so looking at how do we age healthfully and also extending our lifespan and our health span. And you shared that much of aging is about the damage caused by environment and lifestyle. Exactly. Right? So we just talked a little bit about the food input. We talked a little bit about the stress input. What else should we pay, be paying attention to as far as our environment? Yeah, so the way I look at overall aging of the skin is I focus on five main factors that really contribute to it. Uh, the first is gonna be nutrient depletion. You know, so once again, our food, and that being a huge part of this, the foundation of that house is not as nutritious as it used to be. Uh, there was a study that looked from between 1950 and 1999 and found a significant reduction in the nutritional content quality of our food in six different uh, nutrients. Specifically, three, three that stood out to me were vitamin C, iron, uh, and protein. So nutrient depletion is a huge cause of aging of the skin. Second thing I mentioned just a minute ago was collagen degradation. That also big component of it. Diet can have a big impact on that. Third thing is inflammation, specifically chronic inflammation. Now there's a difference between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation can actually be very, very beneficial for us. You know, when you get a cut on your skin and your body creates acute inflammation on that cut to help heal it, that's actually a good thing. Cosmetic treatments, laser treatments, chemical peels, uh, microneedling, those are all creating acute inflammation. And kind of like the whole uh, concept of hormesis, the body reacts to acute inflammation or acute trauma by actually becoming uh, stronger after it heals that. Um, so, but chronic inflammation is a whole other story, and that is a big ager of our skin. The fourth cause of aging of the skin that we focus on is going to be oxidation or free radicals. And then the fifth cause of that uh, is going to be a buildup of cellular waste. And so by focusing on these different things, diet being a huge part of it, but once again, what you eat, when you eat, uh, supplements, skincare products, and treatments, we can, we can really target all five of those to efficiently uh, reverse that and allow our body to once again regenerate itself. So uh, this just immediately made me think about a 
just a basic skin scrub, mm -hmm. right? And just it it is something that creates inflammation temporarily, but it your can. skin ends up looking so much healthier and brighter and all these things. So basically all of the skin rejuvenating treatments um, that are actually trying to tighten your skin are all based off of traumatizing your skin to a certain amount and by doing that, essentially, it's like you take those logs that are starting to fall apart, and as those logs, the, the collagen heals itself, it heals itself in a tighter fashion. Uh, and so with lasers, it does it using light energy or heat. With chemical peels, it does it using an acid. Um, with microneedling, it does it using a physical poke or needle in, uh, poke into the skin. And all of these will then cause a controlled trauma, and, and your skin will rebound by, by actually looking and feeling more youthful. The problem is, is you have to be careful because if that trauma is too aggressive, mm -hmm. then you get scarring and that you definitely do not want. And so it's, you know, it's the same thing when you're looking at hormesis, you know, if you are doing a cold plunge, then you can do that for a period of time. But if you're in it for too long, you could get really, you know, ill from that, you know, your body temperature can go to a level that can be very harmful for you. Uh, and so we look at in some ways at, at these cosmetic treatments the same way. You know, if you think about this, and this is tying back to the skin differences between men and women, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some women can have 20 different skincare products while their husband is like washing his balls with the soap <laughs> that he's washing his face with, you know, the <clears throat> yeah. same thing. And it's just like his skin looks amazing after, you know, whatever, you know, in his 60s or whatever. And we're, we're negating some of these other lifestyle factors because it's mm -hmm. not just the topical thing and having great topical uh, applications is is important and this is what i want to ask you about before we switch gears and kind of talk a little bit more about the internal but alcohol-based um skincare products yeah. like can you talk a little bit about that yeah so uh back in the i mean really <clears throat> up until recently yeah. a lot of us thought that using astringents alcohol-based toners and products like that were actually good for us one thing that we are finding we're kind of with the skin where we were with the gut maybe 20 years ago, where we discovered that there's this thing called a gut microbiome, and most traditional physicians kind of ignored that, whereas the forward-leaning holistic um, you know, practitioners were talking about it. And now we know that the skin has the same thing. We have a skin microbiome. We have billions of uh, bacteria that live on the surface of our skin, and those bacteria do exert some type of impact on the health of our skin. Now, we're very early in our knowledge of it. We don't know just how important they are. You know, we know with the gut, the gut microbiome, it has massive impacts on your overall body's health. I don't know that the skin microbiome is quite that important, uh, but we do know that, that when you disrupt that skin microbiome, same thing can happen when you disrupt the gut microbiome. So using, let's say, a lot of alcohol where you're literally killing off, you're stripping away that healthy bacteria, you can have unhealthy bacteria that potentially can go in its place. Uh, and so it is really important. You know, one of the big things over the last few years uh, that has been a trend with skincare uh, has been preserving the skin barrier. And essentially meaning that you leave that gut bacteria or that uh, uh, probiotics, those uh, beneficial microbiome, that bacteria on the surface of your skin, you leave it alone and let it kind of do its thing. And so trying less aggressive treatments overall and not stripping your skin of that microbiome is actually really important. Yeah, there's two things that are similar with the microbes in the gut and the skin. These microbes are producing compounds. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things we don't understand yet. Like what are they producing? But we know that it tends to have some kind of a protective effect. Mm -hmm. And the other part is having the protective effect, which is protecting our skin from pathogens, things like certain things can make it through your skin and make you sick or cause an infection. Yeah. And so if we're stripping away our protection haphazardly, and you just mentioned it, yeah, because I remember not that long ago using alcohol-based stuff, you know, myself trying to have healthier skin when I was like, you know, in, in college. Yeah. And, you know, thankfully that has changed, but even more so thankfully for your work to like educate us on, it's more than just the topical thing. We've got to look at this from the inside out. And I want to ask you about this specifically um, because you go into detail with all of the things you mentioned, but yeah. cellular waste mm -hmm. jumped out in yeah. particular. So how do we support this kind of metabolic waste m removal so that our skin is getting clogged up and backed up? So to simplify it essentially is that 
what being alive, we have cells that will create uh, waste products. And these waste products are organelles, they're proteins, they may be discarded, used up kind of mitochondria. And these, this waste product can build up in our, in our cells especially like our skin cells. And when these the cellular waste builds up, it causes our cells to essentially function less efficiently, as if you are older. Uh, and the way that our cells then clear out this intracellular waste is a process called autophagy. Autophagy means self-eating. You've brought it up on the podcast before, uh, but essentially it's self-eating. It's a recycling of these intracellular, of this intracellular waste, these intracellular proteins that are essentially gunking up the mechanism. You recycle it for energy, and then what happens is that the cells function more efficiently afterwards as if they're more youthful. Um, but the problem is, is for autophagy to work, for this intracellular recycling process to happen, your body has to run out of energy, essentially, so that it looks to that intracellular waste for energy. Because if it's being fed energy constantly, it won't necessarily go into that process, that autophagy process, because it doesn't need it. Well, in our standard American diet and our standard American lifestyle, we are not used to not eating. You know, I mean, we are constantly snacking and eating all day in general. And so that does not allow that process of autophagy to occur. On top of that, we also know that as you get older, like so many things in life, autophagy slows down. Naturally, it slows down. And so it is definitely important for us as we get older to keep that in mind and to try to get that, that autophagy process going. And the way to do that, essentially, simply put, is to stop eating for a while. Okay. And so the easiest way to do it is to intermittent fast. If you take start start off, if you haven't done much of it before, just start off by doing a 12-hour fast. So maybe you stop eating at 8 p.m. and then you don't eat until 8 a.m. the next morning. If you can get yourself to it, try to do a 16-hour fast where you stop eating at 8 p.m. and then you don't eat again until the next day at about noon. Getting that 16-hour fast gives your body time for it to then use that uh, intracellular waste products in that process of autophagy and to seriously turn back the clock on the inside with our cells. Now, one thing that we did in the book is that we've got a three-week jumpstart where we took people and we had them uh, on a certain diet. We cleaned up their diet. We had them um, on certain supplements. We had them take uh, and use certain skincare products. In week one, we had them basically just clean up their diet and then do the supplements and the skincare. Weeks two and three, we added two days each week of intermittent fasting where they stopped eating at 8 p.m. and then they didn't eat until noon the next day. And then what we did, which I haven't seen done before, is that when they started refeeding at noon the next day, they, for the rest of that day, they uh, ate a diet that could promote autophagy. You know, one thing that we have learned is that there are certain foods that can promote the autophagy process, even though you're not fasting. And those foods are healthy fats, so omega-3 fatty uh, acid-rich foods, so like uh, cold water fish, like tuna, trout, salmon, uh, and then uh, foods that are uh, filled with polyphenols. Polyphenol-rich foods also great for autophagy. So now you're looking at bright and dark colored berries, um, green leafy vegetables, darker colored vegetables as well. And the idea is that you can hopefully continue that autophagy process for a total for a good 24 hours and not leave it at just that 16. So good. So good. And the polyphenols and a lot of these things have multifactorial oh, yeah. benefit. Like the oh, polyphenols yeah. are great for your gut and all the things. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, this gut skin connection, I think more science is going to come out kind of fleshing yes. that out. As you mentioned, you know, talking to a gastroenterologist like about your skin, like, you know, fix the gut. Yeah. And also Hippocrates, you know, famously, he didn't tell me personally, you know, but I mean, we're, so old, but we're not that these, old. <laughs> whenever we say these quotes, I'm just like, ah, but, you know, his, his story that he said that all disease begins in the gut. Hmm. And in particular, he was really renowned for treating skin issues. Hmm. And certain things weren't involved in his practice. Part, part of it was fasting. Mm -hmm. And he also used something he called serum, which is whey protein, funny hmm. enough. Hmm. But it was like a topical treatment okay. as well. It's like, it's all these fascinating things. And you hear these things. And our system is supposed to be inspired by the father of modern medicine. But then we forget like to take care of the gut. And so the polyphenols is huge. So if you could, for everybody, just kind of across the board, what are some of the recommendations as far as a skincare routine? Just some basic things that we could all do to have healthier, younger, fresher looking skin. 
So one of the things that we did for the book is that we really simplified the skincare routine down um, because it is very confusing when you go to the store and like this product's better than Botox. This one is the latest, you know, best thing for your skin. What do you do? So we basically, I put together a very simple skincare routine that anybody can do. And we found that, that it takes literally two minutes a day and we tested people on it. People who weren't necessarily taking good care of their skin before, but they also weren't horribly aged or anything. And we put them on it for two months and then we actually took before and after photos and we asked people online how much younger do they look and it turns out that they looked an average of about five years younger so we called it the two minutes five years younger skincare routine and it's very simple every morning you cleanse your skin with a cleanser appropriate for your skin type so if you've got oily skin i recommend a foaming cleanser if you've got like drier or sensitive skin then a more milky or hydrating cleanser is better Second step, you apply an antioxidant serum. I mentioned earlier, one of the main ages of our skin is oxidation and free radicals. Antioxidants neutralize free radicals. So, so important to use a vitamin C or an antioxidant serum every morning to protect your skin. And then I recommend if you're gonna be out to wear a sunscreen, at least an SPF 30. And we can talk about sunscreens in the future if you, er, <laughs> if you want. That's all you have to do in the morning. Cleanser, uh, antioxidant serum, sunscreen if you're gonna be out. In the evening, cleanse your skin. So important. If you only wash your face once a day, make sure it's in the evening because you got to get rid of that day's worth of dirt and dust and grime and pollution. Uh, and if you wear makeup, you want to get rid of that as well. And then you want to apply an anti-aging cream. The one that most dermatologists and plastic surgeons recommend, super easy to find, is a retinol. Retinol is a derivative of vitamin A. Prescription strength retinol is Retin-A. Over-the-counter strength is retinol. Some people try to go for the Retin-A. Retin-A has been very scientifically proven to improve wrinkles, to smooth the skin, to exfoliate the skin, to thicken the dermis of the skin, the deeper layers of the skin, and even reverse early pre-skin cancers. So it kind of does everything, but it's hard on your skin. And so the retinol is the over-the-counter version that most people can, can tolerate. And that's all you have to do at night. Cleanse your skin, apply retinol. If you've got dry skin and you want to add a moisturizer on top of that, Feel free to do that, but a moisturizer does not reverse aging of the skin. It just is hydrating and makes it more comfortable. And then the final thing is once a week, if you have sensitive skin, two to three times a week, if you've got quote unquote normal skin, you want to exfoliate your skin. You can do that with a gentle scrub, or you can do that with, let's say, an alpha hydroxy acid type of appeal. That's all you have to do. You know, simple steps. You can buy these products at your local drugstore. Uh, ideally, I always encourage people to buy Clean Beauty, so it's something that doesn't have added fragrances and, and, and additives that aren't nece necessary for that. Um, but if you stick to that type of a skincare regimen, you're gonna be way ahead of probably 90% of people out there. I love that. And I love the little note about the exfoliation to, to, to not overdo it. You know, give yes. your skin a chance to heal. It's like a little exercise, the hormetic stressor, allowing it to heal. Yes, if you are exfoliating your skin and you find that it's constantly irritated and red, you are overdoing it, do less of that. Okay, Definitely. you've mentioned a particular nutrient which might be surprising for skin health a couple of times now, vitamin C. Yes. You know, we tend to think about it in this like vanilla lens of like good for your immune system, mm -hmm. but it's this powerful antioxidant. And it's one of those things that is required by your skin as well for general health and, and resilience. Yeah, I mean, it, honestly, it goes back to, you know, our middle school and high school science classes where we were taught the importance of vitamin C and collagen and scurvy, how there were these sailors that would go for these extended trips. And when they ran out of fresh fruits and vegetables, they ran out of vitamin C and then they would get these sores in their mouth and on their skin because vitamin C is absolutely essential for collagen production. So on top of that, it also is a very powerful antioxidant. It's the easiest antioxidant to get both by mouth as well as topically on the surface of your skin. Uh, but here's a little tip for the listeners. If you want to take that to the next level, if you add vitamin C and vitamin E together, there was a study that found that they are synergistic and you get mm -hmm. an even better antioxidant protection if you use vitamin C and E uh, combined. Yes, there's actually a study that I cited in, in one of my books looking at vitamin C and E improving mm -hmm. sleep quality Oh wow! as well. You know, and in particular, reducing the symptoms of sleep apnea. Oh, interesting. Like, who knew? Yeah. You know, very, very powerful. But again, when we look at these things in just one way, you know, get tunnel vision with it, we miss out on real food, real nutrients are great for your whole body in many ways. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and they can make big changes. I think that people poo-poo it. I mean, I'm still a surgeon and I know that there are certain things that you just 
have to have surgery for if you want to get there. You know, if you've lost a hundred pounds and you've got skin hanging from your body, yeah, there's no food you're going to eat that's going to make it go away. There's no chemical peel that will do that. Unfortunately, the only option is surgery. But outside of, you know, kind of more extreme type cases, you know, most of these types of things we can really treat pretty effectively without going under the knife. Well, since I just brought up sleep, is beauty sleep a real thing? It is. Yeah. So sleep, you know, one of the parts of the book that um, I'm really proud of is kind of is the focus that we have on lifestyle alterations. Uh, we er, we talked earlier about stress and how stress is such a, a big deal with premature aging. You definitely need your sleep because that's when your body really rejuvenates itself. Um, but I think that there are also a lot of other practices that we can do that can slow down the process of aging that isn't quite as direct as applying, let's say, a cream on your skin. Uh, I'm a big fan of yoga. I think as we get older, that mobility is so, so important to staying young and active and keeping your sense of balance. Um, you know, I have, a, I wrote an article that's kind of interesting because walking is is great and it's, an, it's a great activity as we get older. But one of the things I put in the book is that walking is not the perfect exercise. You know, I have, my parents are in their 80s. My mom's not quite there, but almost there. My in-laws are in their 80s. And for them, what they do is they walk. That's their, that's their quote unquote exercise. But the problem, let's say with walking is that you are only using those muscles to power you forward. You're not using any other muscles and you're not using the fast twitch muscle fibers that are so important to stabilize you if you trip. Uh, one of the things I put in the book was that there was a study that found that over the age of 50, it was something like a 30% mortality rate if you break your hip, if you're over the age of 50. And that, so that is something that you really, really want to avoid as you get older and you want to stay once again limber and, and active. And the way to do that is to make sure that you are working those fast twitch muscle fibers and working on balance. Like I said, with yoga, the fast twitch muscle fibers, you do that with strength training. Uh, and so really looking at kind of the overall aging picture is so, so important yeah. um, because as we get older, not only do you want your skin to look nicer, but by actually being more active and exercising, that also really will put an impact on the quality of your skin too. So those lifestyle factors are huge. And, and we unfortunately ignore that too much in our, in my field of plastic surgery and in dermatology as well. Yeah. You know, the, the field, uh, in, the framing in our culture of beauty has been so focused on fat mm -hmm. and missing out on the importance of muscle. Yes. And there's this movement taking place right now. We're in the midst of it that is muscle centric yep. and muscle centric medicine and shout out to uh, our, Dr. Gabrielle. Common Lyon. friend Gabrielle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, really understanding our muscle is an endocrine organ. Mm -hmm. And again, being able to produce hormones related to, we talked about our skin being related to our hormone health as well. We can manufacture so many incredible compounds that you can't buy mm -hmm. yet. <laughs> and we can make these things when we're utilizing our muscles and doing strength training. And so I love that pairing. Like, yes, walking is great. We've got all kinds of benefits here, the lymphatic system, all this stuff. Yeah. But we need to focus on building some muscle. If you want to not just be, you know, live a longer life, but to healthfully live life. Yeah, it's that difference between um, health span and lifespan. You know, I mean, our traditional medical system is great at extending your lifespan. You know, people are living way past the years that, that we would normally think that they should because our medical system is propping them up, essentially. Uh, but the idea is you want to extend your health span where you're actually active and healthy and feeling great. That's what we really want to extend. And unfortunately, our traditional medical system is not great with that because they're so focused on those interventions that keep people alive when they're maybe not making those lifestyle changes that can prevent the need for those interventions. Yeah. And you share in the book that, and this is the reality, is that our appearance, someone who does look youthful, it is correlated with how long they're going to live. So can you talk about that Danish study that you yeah, cited in the book? Yeah, so there was a Danish study where they actually looked at identical twins. And this study found that the younger looking of the identical twins actually seemed to live longer than the ones that looked older. Now, we don't know if this is correlation or causation, but it is very interesting. And I tell you, one of the things, you know, for me that's important is, you know, I see people in my office who are who have unhealthy habits. And I tell them, look, you know, you've got to quit smoking or you got to quit vaping because I, I can say, you know, it's horrible for your lungs. You can get emphysema. You can increase your risk of heart disease and they blow that off. But if I tell them, number one, I'm not going to operate on you unless you get off of this, then they go, oh, well, then I'm going to quit. Or I tell them, you know, if you do that, you're going to get more wrinkles. They go, oh, you know. So I think part of it, sometimes what I try to do, which I think can be very helpful and powerful, is appeal to a person's sense of vanity 
to help them change to healthier habits, you know, because sometimes it's not enough to say, you know, you could, you know, die younger, you could get lung cancer, you could get heart disease, they don't care. But man, if you tell them that they're going to get deeper wrinkles, or their skin's going to look shoddy, then sometimes that's what drives them. And so sometimes it's finding the right motivation to try to help our followers and our patients to try to get to where we want them to be so that they can be as healthy as possible. And in my situation, oftentimes it, it starts with vanity and that's okay as long as I get them you know, where we want to be and get them healthy and happy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I found that button works really well in, in my practice too. You know, it's just because all of these, you get all these great benefits. You're not going to die from a chronic disease prematurely and all these things, but it's just that might not push the button for a lot of people. But yeah. when it comes to our body composition and things like that and leveraging that, yep. but this is also the... The, the true sign of a really great practitioner is paying attention to the person Thank and you. finding yeah, that psychological leverage because everybody's different too, you know, mm -hmm. and just being able to lean into that thing and looking for, even with kids, like the result that they want, you know, like if I'm coming in, if I'm working with a family back in the day, it would be, you know, maybe helping with, you know, they've got tons of cereals or whatever, just sitting, sitting up on top of the refrigerator. And, you know, the mom is wanting to, normalize her blood sugar you know maybe she's on metformin right now and she's been struggling for a while with like wanting to lose 50 pounds she's all in but she's like but my kids yeah right and it's just like talking with them you know maybe it's a, one of the kids is 12 and he's he wants to play basketball and i'm just like you know you know what you can outperform if yeah. you're doing you know adding this in and you could see their eyes light up yeah. just by paying attention to their own motivations yeah and every kid you know i've got two ch two children i you know you have three it's Every kid has their own motivations. And as a parent, it's it's helpful and useful to find out what those motivations are because, yeah. you know, I, I my son, he's the older one. And for years, I wondered, like, do you care about anything? Like, do you care about <laughs> anything? And it was to the point where we would put him in timeout and all these things, and he didn't care. Um, and finally, it got to a point where <laughs> where if he would be mean to his sister, we would I would tell him, I'm going to throw your, to what, your favorite toy away. You know, if you're mean to her, you hit her, I'm going to throw it away. And it was eventually, it was always like the broken one that we we're going to toss out anyway, but oh no, he doesn't want that. So I like trying to find their motivation. Now his motivation is all internal, which I'm so happy. You know, my daughter, I look at her, I like look at her sideways and she's like gets upset. You know, I don't need to motivate her because she just is such a people pleaser. Um, but each kid is so different. And, and I think it's the same thing with our patients and our followers. It's like everybody has different motivations and it's trying to figure out what you can spark within them to help them change their lives for the better. And like I said, for me, vanity is part of it, but you know, that's that's our society nowadays. And if I can help my my followers and my patients to get where they want to be by by utilizing that together, then I'll, I'll you know, hey, I'll power to it. Yeah. You know, the ancient tenet is to know thyself as well, to utilize this with for ourselves. Yes. But that takes a level of self-honesty, you know, just tuning in like what really does motivate me to do this behavior mm -hmm. long term to get the result that I want. You mm -hmm. know, for some people, it's not enough that they're going to, you know, fill in the blank, lose 10 pounds or, you know, n normalize their blood sugar, whatever it is. Yeah. You've got to know what is going to motivate you and tune into that, lean into it, grab onto it. And basically, we can placebo ourselves. Yeah. You know, we can placebo our own mind. Or the external environment is going to do it for us. So what is your motivation, Sean? What's your main That's motivation, my question. friend? Motivation for what specifically? For staying healthy. It recently changed. I can't believe you're asking me this. Like, this literally changed this, this past week or two. You oh, know, wow. I've been, like, readjusting to this new motivation. For the past few years, you know, um, probably the last at least five years, my motivation you know, the reason I'm training, the reason that I'm, you know, um, caring for myself was to to be stronger for my family, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to do whatever is necessary to support, protect, take care of my family and to be strong for the people that entrust in me in serving them at the highest level possible. Mm -hmm. So I was I was literally training with my audience in mind and with my family in mind so mm -hmm. that I can be greater for them yeah. and do whatever needs to be done is recently sh shifted in the last couple of weeks where that is a powerful motivation yeah but it's still external mm -hmm. and now it's for me mm -hmm. it's for me to be the greatest expression of of god or or life or 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 what the universe's potential 
expression is mm -hmm. with this person mm -hmm. uh, that I am, you know? So just being able to express the most beauty, the most potential that I possibly can for mm -hmm. me, yeah. for me. Yeah. And of course the spillover is gonna help and continue on all the other things, but the motivation is, is shifted. I'm adjusting to it still. I haven't completely locked into that. Yeah. But just seeing that, you know, if it's if it's externally focused, so many things can happen out here yeah. that don't match up. Yep. And so having me being the North Star, it's like it's unlocking a whole different power, I, I feel. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Ah, man, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting <laughs> on, on talking about that, man. But I, I want to ask you something really interesting as well, which is the power of our thoughts and our perspective. Mm -hmm. And you give it this term in the book, you say old thinking. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think part of this, you know, one of the things <laughs> is that um, as I've gotten older and I'm 51 now, um, I had this I, I had this idea that I didn't want to be like the 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 not cool dad, you know. I didn't want to be that that dad where you go out with your kids and they're like, I don't want to be seen with this guy, you know. <laughs> and the crazy thing now is that I've got this massive following on TikTok and I go out with my kids and I have teenagers that come to me and they're like, hey, can we take a picture of you and stuff? So like somehow I'm actually not the uncool dad, although I was not cool when I was younger and my kids age, so it's kind of <laughs> weird. Um, but I think there really is something to the young and old thinking. You know, we, as we get older, there's this belief that we have to think a certain way, we have to act a certain way, we have to dress a certain way. And unfortunately, um, following that thinking can, in our mind, cause us to age more quickly. And because of that, we can act that way too. You know, if we think we're old, maybe we're not going to stand up straight. If we think we old, we're old, maybe we're not going to try to tr try to do these new activities. And there's so much to experiencing life in a more youthful way, trying new things. There's neuroplasticity. There's how you make new nerve con uh, connections in your brain that may potentially stave off dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and once again, it's how you live your life. And so one of the things that we do is my wife and I, is we're always keeping up with what's going on currently in the world. Like we don't want, at one point my, my wife made fun of me one day where she's like, what type of music you listen to? I'm like, I just been listening to mostly eighties. And she's like, oh my gosh, you gotta get back. You gotta get into the, like the current stuff. And so because now I'm on TikTok and all this stuff, I keep track of all like the, the new things, but it, part of that is also keeping me young. And I think that that there is a way, there is a whole thing as far as acting younger, holding yourself in that way, dressing younger. And now I'm not going to dress as if I'm 18. I'm not, you know, shopping at Hollister or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but maybe not necessarily dressing like a 51 year old too, yeah. and and caring about your appearance because all of that really comes into play with the whole environment that you that you create around yourself. Yeah. Uh, the funny thing, though, Sean, is I get people that'll ask me all the time on social media, like, how old are you? And I'll say 88. And they go, oh, my gosh, you look so young for 88. You could pass for 40. And then sometimes they'll ask me how old I am, and I'll answer 25. And they go, dang, you are old looking. You should use your own products. <laughs> and so it's, it's fun. I think, you know, in the end, you're only as young as you feel. I'm sorry, as old as you feel yeah. and as old as you act in a lot of ways. And so, you know, in the book, I give certain very simple tips, you know, stand up straight, you know, be active, try to exercise, learn new things. You know, these are things that people do when they're in their teens and 20s. But as they get older, sometimes people get very set in their ways and they get in the same routine over and over again. That overall is not necessarily good overall for longevity. Yeah, I love the quote that says, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like it's a secret that should not be a secret. Because of our cultural programming, we tend to stop doing certain things when mm -hmm. we get to be a certain age. Yeah. And play is so important. And you look at cultures, you know, that have, you know, the most centurions and that kind of thing. People are dancing, getting together, exactly. storytelling and being active and all these things. It's just like it's continue to be a part of life here in the United States. Not so much, you know, and I and I distinctly remember certain things that, you know, my mom would say or, you know, my grandparents and this aversion to like you mentioned, you said this earlier and it was so important, which is those fast twitch muscle fibers and your body literally is on a use it or lose it basis when yeah. it comes to those things. And it is one of the things that this is the largest body of data has affirmed this. You don't have to lose those fibers, no, but you have to train them. Yeah. 
if you're not continuing to train them on a consistent basis, you will definitely, especially as you get older, the degradation will set in quicker. And so I've been a big proponent in it's, several of the shows have been focused on this the past year on sharing the science with people to do certain explosive fast switch muscle exactly. movements. I am the biggest fan right now of a jump rope. Mm -hmm. I think it's just like one of the greatest inventions ever. And you don't, but you, here's the thing. If you'd feel like I can't even jump over that shit, there are jump ropes that don't even connect now. <laughs> they got like, they're kind of like weighted. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. use one in each hand, but just the act of like jumping up and down yeah. and all of those different muscle fibers and ligaments and tendons get that attention. So if anybody can walk away today with three advocations for their exercise, you shared walking, yes, and you, you've you seen this with your with your folks who are in their 80s, by the way, and they're mm -hmm. walking, yeah. so it's something to that, but also strength training, and the other part is, if people can, whether it's uh, a jump rope or, dare I say, continue to do jumps, box jumps, mm -hmm. maybe a tiny little platform, but just being able to jump, to mm -hmm. hop up onto things, it's one of those skill sets that, when we're a kid, we're, you can't stop them from jumping. Yeah. But as we get older, we that's one of the things that we stop doing is is jumping around. And one of the things we I put in the book is a friend of mine, Deborah Atkinson. She's a specialist for exercise for people over 50. And I was talking with her and we were talking about the whole fast twitch muscle fibers. And I put this in the book. You know, if you don't, if you have, you know, you're on the older side and let's say you aren't doing strength training and all that and you want to know a place to start, the place to start would be to do basically some type of a, a push-up or chest press, and you can do that as a Nautilus type of equipment, uh, to do leg presses and rows. If you do those three exercises, then you're going to work the vast majority of those muscle groups. So once again, it's a chest press, leg press, and rows. That leg press could also be a squat. Um, but if you do those three, then that's a good place for most people to start. Very simple exercises. You know, you can have people help you out with it, but those are three things that will work the vast majority of things out. And if you want to add the jump rope and all those types of things, that's all that's just going to help. It's all gravy. Yeah, and just two to three times a week with those yeah. strength training exercises, whole body, do those three exercises, you're going to be in a really good place moving forward. Exactly. So there are some additional things that, you know, it's 2024 right now. In the year 2000. <sighs> Did you ever watch Conan O'Brien? I have. Yeah. He used to do this skit, you know. Uh, anyways, we're living in the future right now, you know, and there are some really cool innovations that are non-invasive or minimally invasive, like red light mm -hmm. therapy. Can you talk a little bit about that? What is your uh, what is your perspective on that? So interesting. Red light therapy is something where if you talk to a plastic surgeon, they may look at you with a blank stare because we don't talk about it in plastic surgery at all. Dermatologists know, know a decent amount of it. And then alternative health, health experts are all about red light therapy. So the idea behind red light therapy essentially is, they, is the energy from that red light will be infused into your cells. So for the skin, it would be your skin cells. And essentially what it does, your, your mitochondria takes up that energy and it powers the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of your cells. And it causes the mitochondria, we believe, to increase its production of ATP. So essentially you are taking your cells and you're adding energy to them, making them more, more energetic and essentially more youthful. So red light therapy devices for the skin can occur in a different, different types. There's handheld devices that are kind of a pain because you treat a quadrant of your face at a time usually. Uh, there are tabletop devices which are nice and square and you can treat the whole face at one time which, are, which is really convenient. There are creepy looking Hannibal Lecter type masks that you can wear around and scare your significant other while you wear it. Um, and then there are whole red light therapy beds that some people use as well. Um, so what does the science say about red light therapy? Basically, there are studies, split face studies, where they split the face in half and they treat one side of the face with a sham light and the other side of the face with red light and have found after about 90 days of treatment an improvement in wrinkles, hydration, and skin elasticity. So it definitely works. We think it works once again by kind of adding energy to the mitochondria of our cells, although it's not 100% been proven to my understanding. Good thing with red light therapy, no downtime. You know, if you want to start with something, that is a great place to start. Awesome, awesome. Okay. A lot of our health has to do with not doing certain things, mm -hmm. all right? Are there anything, let's talk just from the lens of nutrition, yes. things that we might want to avoid that yes. can be contributing to degradation of our health, accelerated aging, things like that. 
So I mentioned earlier that there are these five causes of the aging of the skin, nutrient depletion, collagen degradation, chronic inflammation, uh, oxidation, and buildup of cellular waste. When you look at inflammation, the main cause of chronic inflammation of the skin is sugar. Mm. And so reducing the amount of sugar that you eat because sugar can actually bond to the collagen of your skin. And I mentioned earlier that our collagen, it's like the logs of a log cabin. As we get older, those logs become frayed, they start to fall apart. What sugar will do is it will actually bond to the collagen fibers, the actual collagen. It will bond to it and cause that collagen to become permanently kinked. So it's not that tight log in a log cabin anymore, it's kinked that is prematurely aging to the skin. And so that process uh, creates advanced glycation end products, that's the term, for those collagen uh, sugar hybrids, those connections. Um, so sugar creates chronic inflammation, so reducing the amount of sugar, super important. I know you've been great with educating uh, people on that. And then the other group, uh, the other thing that we look at with oxidation, we talked about how antioxidants fight oxidation and uh, are so healthy for our skin, but what where do what does it fight it fights free radicals and where do free radicals come from well free radicals are created by our body uh, just being alive our body's metabolism creates free radicals as a waste product and these free radicals when they are numerous can actually damage the dna of our cells of our skin cells let's say um, and so antioxidants will neutralize free radicals but if you have too many free radicals that are attacking your body we don't have enough antioxidants to support that or to neutralize them, that's when you get DNA damage and you get uh, premature aging. So where do you get free radicals from? Well, you can get them from pollution in the air. You can get it from, let's say, cigarette smoking, from automobile exhaust, but you can also get it from ultra-processed foods. So ultra-processed foods, especially if they are fried, like deep-fried foods, are filled with free radicals. And so reducing the amount of ultra-processed foods or even eliminating them is a great way to improve the health of your skin. So you're saying McDonald's french fries. As good as they may taste, going down <laughs> are, the, are quite possibly the worst food for your skin. Maybe not the worst because probably the worst would be if they smother them in sugar. <laughs> mm, <laughs> so right. yeah, I would say maybe a donut might be worse than the fries, but that's all the same idea, you know? And there are those foods that not only, you know, have sugar, but they also are ultra processed, you know, like uh, dessert stuff that you buy, you know, that's packaged in boxes that you buy at the grocery store, those could be potentially the worst. Yeah, I went to a carnival recently and they were literally oh, yeah. deep frying everything. Yeah, you want yeah. Deep fried Snickers, deep fried Oreos. Have you seen the deep fried butter? <laughs> there is deep fried butter out there that they sell. <laughs> House way. Wow. That's, yes. That's something else. Deep fried sticks of butter. All and right. It's probably not grass fed butter, I doubt. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you about this because, you know, this. You said this term several times, it's super important. Again, it's the majority of what we're seeing when we see our skin in the mirror and co with collagen. There are a lot of different collagen products on the market yes. now, and there's some controversy around that. Let's talk a little bit about that. So yeah, I mean, if, it's funny because I will post occasionally on social media about collagen supplements, and invariably I get a ton of comments of, I asked my family doctor about collagen supplements and he said that that doesn't work. Um, there actually is a doctor that I respect on online. Uh, he is a weight loss surgeon and he's got a big bushy beard and he talks with a lot of authority when he speaks. Uh, he's probably in his 60s and he seems very well read and, and all that. And he made a video a couple years ago about collagen supplements and saying, you know, basically collagen supplements don't work. If you really want to take collagen, a collagen supplement, save your money and buy Jello gelatin. It's the same thing. And I thought, oh, geez. But the funny thing, Sean, is that just a few weeks ago, he made a new video and he's watching the old video about collagen. He swipes it away and he goes, you know, some of us physicians, we make decisions and we have opinions based off of the available evidence at that time. And the available evidence is now telling me that collagen supplements do work. I was wrong. And I thought, oh my gosh, here is a doctor uh, who's in his probably 60s, who speaks with such authority, and he's yeah. so sure of his and he of his opinion, and he says it's wrong. So, what does the science say about collagen supplements? You know, we uh, take collagen supplements. People take it for the health of their hair, their skin, their nails, their bones. That's type one collagen. Um, the science, basically, the studies look at it, are all pretty conclusive. Uh, I mean, people may say that they're not, but if you actually look at the studies, there are so many studies that support the use of collagen supplements. 
So for example, there was a meta-analysis in 2021. They looked at over 1,100 people taking 90 days of a hydrolyzed collagen supplement and found after 90 days a statistically significant improvement in wrinkles and hydration and elasticity of the skin. Uh, and that's a, over 1,100 people. There have been prospective randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials that have been performed where people take, let's say, 90 days or two months of, of collagen peptide supplements, hydrolyzed collagen, and have found after they actually biopsy their skin that there is an increased amount of collagen in that skin biopsy. So there is a ton of research to support the use of collagen and it improving the skin, hence that doctor going back and saying, look, I was wrong. I think in the end with collagen supplements, there are a lot of people out there who are just anti-supplement period. And, and the way I describe it, it's people who don't know what they don't know. And I've been at that point, you know, when I was early on in my career and I was a very traditional plastic surgeon, I didn't know what I didn't know. And then I realized that there was a lot I didn't know and I needed to learn that. Um, and so that's kind of how I look at it with collagen. I think the important thing, if you're gonna try a collagen supplement, couple of things, first thing, Make sure it's hydrolyzed collagen peptides. Collagen is a huge protein. And the argument is that how do you know, number one, that your body will actually, that your GI tract will absorb the collagen protein because it's so huge, and how do you know it's going to get to your skin? Well, we know it gets to the skin by those studies I've mentioned to you. But we also know that, that good collagen companies that, that produce these supplements will break that large protein down into individual amino acids and peptides. And that process is called hydrolysis. It basically hydrolyzes the collagen, makes it much smaller. So that's what you want to look for. And then the second thing is that there are five types of collagen out there. Okay. Type one is hair, skin, nails, and bone. Type two is joints. Type three is muscle. Type four is in the kidneys and type five is placenta. So four and five, we don't really pay much attention to, but let's say if you've got joint issues, you don't want to take a beauty collagen that only contains collagen type one, because that's not going to help the cartilage. Uh, if you've got hair issues, you don't want to take one that's just type 2 because that doesn't have the right collagen. So you really want to make sure that it has the right type of collagen for what you're looking for. These are great tips. This is so good. So good. You've also got specific targets, you know, targeted treatments that you talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. And whether this is uh, sagging skin, uh, age spots, and fine lines and wrinkles, plumper lips, and a lot more. And, you know, I love this approach. There's, you, you literally have an A to Z guide here Thank in this you. book. It's such a, it's, a, it's such a wonderful work. And also the, you know, the, the fact that you embed, you know, so much humor and an ability to relate to the information is, is super special. Thank and you. I'm just grateful for, for your approach to things and, you know, letting people know, like, we've got all these tools on the table. We've got all these wonderful advancements in medicine and, at the end of the day, we also need to focus on making sure that you're doing things to stack conditions in your favor from mm -hmm. the inside out, right? And so is there anything else special about the book that you want people to know? Um, I think the big thing that when you come out of it, the last chapter, it really is about gratitude. And I think that how we look at life is so important in how we age. Uh, and I give a story at the end of the book. Uh, one of the things my wife and I are really big into is senior dog rescue. Um, and so it's taking those dogs that are anywhere from 12 to 14 or 15 years old and are looking for a home. And we have done, we have actually adopted five dogs in the last seven or eight years. And four of them have passed, which has been really sad. But you know what they do is, is they teach us so much about aging. Like I get so much more from them than I feel like I give them, even though we give them a home and we love them. Um, but we had a little dog that I talk about in the book. His name was Sammy. And Sammy was uh, I think he was 12 years old, we thought, when we adopted him. My, my wife picked him up. It was like a four-hour drive. And when she picked him up, he was in a basement of a rescue on a bed that reeked of pee. Uh, he was given up by his former owner after he was attacked by a bunch of pit bulls. He was put in the hospital for many months, um, recovered from that injury, was unable to be housebroken after that because he was so used to just peeing in the cage. Mm. Um, and so nobody wanted him. So we adopted him, brought him into the house, and for the first three or four months, he was really skittish. He tried to run away. Um, he was peeing everywhere. <laughs> and we finally figured out that if we put a diaper on him, like he was fine. And so he was this little guy running around in a diaper. And then after about three to four months of having him, he basically let out a sigh, and you could tell he knew he was home. 
And I don't know if it takes that long for those bad memories of the past to go away from their little minds or whether he just realized that, you know, he's home with people who love him. And so throughout the two years that we had him before he died, uh, he had a slip disc in his back. He lost the use of his back legs for a while and stuff. Um, he had uh, surgery for a huge bladder stone. But throughout all of those difficulties, he was always so happy. And so, like, we would joke that whenever we would feed him, he had a huge smile on his face. And he was, like, saying, thank you. You know, thank you for my food. That was, like, kind of our joke. Um, and what I learned from them, especially him, is getting older is a blessing. You know, I mean, who wants the alternative? You know, the alternative is you're in the ground. Um, and so things are hard sometimes. It's not fun to look in the mirror and see a face looking back at you that you don't recognize, that has wrinkles, that has puffiness, that has sagging skin that you don't recognize. Um, that's no fun. But the alternative, like I said, is something we don't want. And so what I try to look at aging is it is truly a blessing to get older. But if you want to fight it every step of the way by doing these things that we've talked about on this interview, by all means do that. Have fun doing it, um, but always, always, always be aware that it is a blessing to get older. And, and so that's kind of what I ended it off with. And, and what I like to have, I think, people leave this conversation with is, is do those things. You know, it's, it's no fun to see those wrinkles, but don't be sad about it. There are things you can do. Uh, and, uh, and if you're not seeing wrinkles, it's just because you haven't lived long enough. Mm, wow. So good. So good. Can you let people know where to pick up a copy of your book? Yeah. So my book is Younger for Life. It's available wherever books are sold. I try to encourage people to go to their uh, local bookstore. Um, if you want to buy online, it's on all the different places, Amazon, Barnes Noble, stuff like that. But if you go to bookshop.org, uh, that's a website where you can actually choose your local bookstore. And if you buy it from there, they will mail it to you. And then your local bookstore will actually get the profit from that sale. Um, and then if you go to autojuvenation.com, it's our book website, autojuvenation.com will give you a ton of free gifts, including 10 free recipes, a $30 gift card for our online store, yunbu.com, where we sell uh, natural and organic supplements and skincare products uh, and a bunch of other things. So autojuvenation.com. And your Instagram handle? Uh, that's Tony Yoon, MD. You just look for Dr. Yoon. You'll find me on social media. It's and and if you have kids who are teenagers, they probably know who I am already. <laughs> and like I, before, you even came in, I was sharing a video with my team. Uh, you did a little Christmas song. Yeah, yeah. So good. Oh, thank so you, good. my friend. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Younger for life. Pick it up everywhere that books are sold. Dr. Tony, you and everybody. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. It's been information withheld from us for a very long time, and it is behind so much frustration, misunderstandings, and the orgasm gap, which is a, it's a big abyss that like not even the world's like greatest daredevil could jump it.